Well, I can tell you, this is a, not only an enormous honor, it is really a treat for all of you to have former Secretary of State George Schultz here with us. And uh, he was not only Secretary of State during the Reagan administration, he was the Secretary of Treasury during the Ford administration, Secretary of Labor during the Nixon administration, and also the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. So four cabinet positions. I don't think there's anyone out there who have had four cabinet positions, so you are unique in many ways. So let me start off by asking Mr. Secretary, what got you interested in energy? Well, I'm Secretary of Labor back in 1969. And President Nixon had me chair a task force on the oil import program. <clears throat> President Eisenhower had thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we used, we were asking for trouble in national security terms. <clears throat> and we were bumping up against it. That was the reason for this task force. And we had a great staff and produced a really good report, which was published. And the president patted me on the head and said, thank you for a nice report. <laughs> there were congressional hearings. Nothing was done. We said in our report, the vulnerability to oil supplies is from the Middle East, so we should minimize our imports from there. We said we should have some sort of reserve, a storage for an insurance policy in case something is cut off. We said the quota system provides all the rents to Saudi Arabia. We should have a tariff system. So at least if we're going to have this, we get the money. And we said, <clears throat> our little task force has been in business now for about six months. And we know more about this subject than anybody else in the government. Energy is a strategic resource. There should be some place in the government that's keeping track of this permanently so it knows what's going on. So all these things seem perfectly obvious to us, but nothing was done. So then, <clears throat> a couple of years later, I'm Secretary of the Treasury, and here comes the Arab oil boycott, almost what we predicted. And it was a wild event. <clears throat> Christmas lights were discouraged. Gas stations were closed on weekends. A lot of electricity was produced by oil in those days. It was a traumatic event. And I remember, and there was no energy department, so the Treasury Department became the energy department, in effect. <clears throat> and <clears throat> people would cam came to me and they said, well, here are some ideas about alternative forms of energy and so on. And they sounded sensible, but there was no real content. But let's work on those. <clears throat> but then the price of oil went down and everything stopped. The same thing happened when we had the Iranian Revolution in 1979. That cut down oil surprise prices went up. People started uh, looking, and then the prices went back down, and everything stopped. So I was um, alarmed by that because I thought we should be pushing on. <clears throat> then I'm Secretary of State in the mid-1980s. By this time, people are more engaged in energy issues. And there were a lot of scientists who thought that the ozone layer was depleting. We had a science group in OMB in the State Department. And we worked with the EPA very closely <coughs> to track this. And we became convinced, and President Reagan became convinced, that scientists who were worried were right. There were quite a few other scientists, perfectly respectable people, who didn't think so. <clears throat> On the other hand, they all agreed that if it happened, it would be a catastrophe. So we did something that you don't do today. In American politics today, if somebody disagrees with you, you try to destroy them. <laughs> In those days, we went about it differently. President Reagan put his arm around them and said, you disagree with us, but we respect you. But you do agree that if it happens, it's a catastrophe. So why don't we take out an insurance policy? And <clears throat> that's an appealing idea. 
That didn't get them on our side, but it got them off our back. And out of this came what's called the Montreal Protocol that dealt with this issue and I think has becoming something that's dealing more with climate change issues as well. But the insurance policy concept is a concept to have in mind because it's sometimes a way to get people who don't agree with you to say, okay, I'll buy that. <coughs> At any rate, in retrospect, I think it's pretty well agreed that the scientists who were worried were right and the Montreal Protocol came along just in time. Well, I see very similar, similar situation today. There, <coughs> at least as I would put it provocatively, any sane person can see that the climate is getting warmer. But there are people who somehow or other don't think so. And it seems to me we should say to them, you know the consequences can be severe. And once they happen, you can't turn them around. It's not like you can decide to turn it off again. So let's take out an insurance policy. What would that insurance policy be? Personally, I think it would consist of a revenue neutral carbon tax. So you put a price on carbon. I'd like to make it revenue neutral so there's no fiscal drag connected with it. And so it doesn't come through to the general public as a kind of grab bag for funding whatever it is you want to fund. That's the problem in California right now. The money from cap and trade is being used to fund things, and some people don't like those things, so they say they're against the program because they're against those things. <coughs> so a revenue to a carbon tax. But the other thing that's essential is to maintain the pace, at least maintain, maybe speak it up if we can, of the R&D in the energy area. <coughs> and we have I think this is something we really have to have our eye on and fight for because it tends to drop out. And we have a much stronger position today than we've ever had because we've had, say, 10, 15 years of fairly significant effort where a large number of very good scientists and engineers have been working on this. <clears throat> and you can point to results. It hasn't been an empty gesture. It's gotten concrete, usable results that have mattered. I have solar panels on my home here on the Stanford campus. I've had them for quite a while, so the lungs just paid for them. And I drive an electric car around. The solar panels produce more electricity than my car uses. So guess what my cost of fuel is? Zero. What's not to like? <laughs> the electric car is coming in. Arun's friends over here in the science and engineering, and I chair the MIT Energy Advisory Panel. They all tell me the battery for the car type batteries are going to get better fast. They're going to be lighter, smaller, less expensive, with more charge. So I say the electric car is here. And it can be here without any subsidy. It'll be competitive. And that's a huge advance in anybody's written. I look for the day, and people are working on it. They're all modest and say, well, we're not there yet. When we learn how to do large-scale storage of electricity, if you can do that, and people are around the edges of it. There's a guy at MIT named Sadaway who has what he calls a flow-type battery. I don't know what that is. Liquid, anyway. liquid metal battery. You know, what? The liquid metal battery. Liquid metal. Well, he knows. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> He's now got a factory, and this is not large scale, but it's bigger scale. And you can do things with a stationary device that are harder, not as hard as if it were having to move. So if you can get to that, all of a sudden you take the intermittency problem away from solar and wind, and you turn it into baseload electricity. That's a breakthrough. So that will, that will happen, I'm convinced. And there are all kinds of other things. So I think <clears throat> one of the big tasks today in our politics is to do everything we can to see that the funding for his old outfit and the funding for these centers of excellence is maintained. We had a, a program <clears throat> that we started over at Hoover, and we got 
And Susan Hockbill, when she was chairman of MIT, was my friend, and, and she got me to chair the MIT Energy Advisory Panel. So we had a deal where Susan brought, I think, 12 MIT scientists mm -hmm. here. And we got about the same number from here. And we had one from Berkeley and one from Livermore. And we spent two days talking about game changers. And then we had a return visit. We went to MIT and we did some further talk about it. <clears throat> we brought our act to Washington. And I was fascinated because John Boehner was Speaker of the House. I knew him. And he set us up with the Republicans on the House Energy Committee. These are supposed to be the bad guys. And so I took a little delegation, including some scientists. Selling them energy R&D was an absolute piece of cake. There's no problem. They're all for it. But as soon as somebody says, well, now the government's got a great idea, or one of these, why didn't the government go into business? You lose everybody. So I said to Ernie Moniz, who was chairman and secretary of energy at the time, Ernie, just focus on the R&D. Keep the government's hands out of the business. Let's, if it's a good idea and profitable, commercial companies will come along, don't worry. <clears throat> but I think it's very saleable. But you've got to sell it. And we have more tools to sell it than ever before because we can point to all these things that have come out of it. Actually, fracking is, came right out of federally supported energy R&D. So it's, pretty, it's been going on and it's been very productive. So in that's fact, my the, challenge. The fracking thing went, goes back to Department of Energy in 1982, <coughs> when you were in the government, uh, Secretary of State. <coughs> the funding for horizontal drilling and, and hydraulic fracturing, the combination of the two started then, yeah, and then the private sector drilling. picked it up. That's right. Yeah. So Mr. Secretary, let me ask you about, um, you always tell, tell us um, that when you make decisions about energy, you got to keep the balance between economic development, national security, and the environment. Because if you ignore one, these are not sustainable in the long run. Could you connect the dots for us on national security on one side and climate change on the other? How do they relate to each other? Well, obviously, You've got to do things for national security that are just for national security. But if you talk to so Jim Mattis, for instance, he for three years was at Hoover. He is a giant. He's now Secretary of Defense. And he will tell you, and he's told me, that climate change produces security issues. And so the better job we can do on it, the less we have to cope with. For example, the demography of the world is changing rapidly. People don't seem to realize it, but it is. And a lot of places that have the most fertility are places where it's going to become harder and harder to live because of water shortages, because of hot weather, and so on. So there's going to be a lot of migration. And the migration is going to be accompanied by conflict. And we've got to figure out how to deal with that. The Europeans are struggling with that issue. We struggle here. Um, but it's a big issue. And <clears throat> so I think there is a connection, and the military see it. The military is probably one of the more, at least in my experience when I was in Washington in the Department of Energy, <clears throat> the Department of Defense was probably my closest partner uh, in in partnering on energy technologies, given what of course, they, they, they knew use about a lot of energy. They so they use, they're the biggest user of energy, yeah. a single user of energy. But the climate change was certainly very much part of their the thinking as to part of the strategy is including climate change uh, in that. We have a lot of international students. Can you raise your hands, international students? So this is a very international crowd. Given what we have seen, let's say, in fracking, where North America is um, energy independent, other parts of the world, the oil price is not fully determined by OPEC now because we control some of the supply. Oh, I think OPEC is over. It's, uh, 
I mean, their, their uh, technique was to uh, cut down on supply, raise the price, and cause scarcities. But we're able to surge now. And they reduce their supply, and other supply comes in. So they lose market share, and they won't get it back. So they have to think about this in wholly different ways. Right, and if, you, if you're electrifying transportation, you know, the, the oil and gas industry is talking about peak demand now, not peak supply. In which case, and if you're producing electricity locally, which is always local, the, the geopolitics of, so maybe you could tell us about what do you think about how the geopolitics of energy will evolve moving forward? Well, here's one example. Right now, we have a lot of concern about Russia, the old Soviet Union. I remember during the Cold War, we had a good relationship with Saudi Arabia, and we persuaded them to pump a lot of oil. So the price for a sustained period was low. I think it was probably below the cost of producing it in the Soviet Union. So the Soviets had no foreign exchange. And I can remember one rather poignant moment when President Reagan said to Mikhail Gorbachev, why aren't you buying more grain? And Gorbachev said, we don't have any money. So there was a direct connection. Now, Russia is being aggressive with uh, Poland, with the Baltic states, let alone Ukraine. And somebody's got to put a stop sign up. One of the things we've been advocating, I've been advocating, and we had a number of the Baltic states ambassadors in to talk about it, is we now can produce oil. We can produce gas. More and more we have LNG capacity. So we ought to put the Baltic states in a position where they don't have to rely on Russian oil and gas because it's pretty clear that Mr. Putin will pull the trigger and he doesn't mind having you freeze to death in the middle of the winter and cut off your gas supplies. So they don't have to be in that position. Lithuania now has an LNG receiving ship in its harbor that's right. getting its LNG from Norway. So that can work, and we ought to be pushing on that. That's in the geopolitical sense. <clears throat> but if you, if you look at Asia, for example, which is where the major growth in both population as well as economy, so the energy demand is going to, you know, uh, go up significantly. If you look at the big two, China and India, uh, in terms of transportation fuel, most in China, most of the fuel consumption is in long haul trucking, and that's going to be hard to electrify. So their demand for oil will be there, and given what we are seeing now um, in the rest of the world. How does that play out? India has no oil and gas, or very little oil and gas, uh, which is why they're going big time into renewables, electricity, and trying to electrify. They're saying that they're not going to sell any gasoline cars after 2030, which is a big deal. So how does this, <laughs> we keep our fingers crossed, um, how does this play out in Asia then? Well, I was in Beijing, it was about 10 years ago, I was there, <coughs> and I had a meeting with uh, Zhu Rongji, who was a fabulous guy, Chinese economic minister. And I went from my hotel to his office. If there had been no traffic or anything, I could have made it in about five minutes, but it took me about three quarters of an hour. So I told him most of that three quarters of an hour, I was sitting in my car, stopped at lights or in traffic. And while I was doing that, the car is idling. So I, I have a car back at Stanford that when it stopped, it, when it stops, it stops. It doesn't idle. So if you could, you, you could do something about your environment problem, get different kind of cars, make a big difference. Well, China has uh, thought about it a lot. And they're going to electric Absolutely. cars. And they're trying to figure out how to do it and so on. It's a, it's a problem to figure out how you would go about it, but the key is improvements in batteries. And that seems to be very much in the cards. And then, of course, you have to produce the electricity. 
and figure out how to do that. I might say right here at Stanford there's a power plant. If you haven't visited it, you ought to take this class over and visit it. Oh, they went there yesterday. You went? Monday. Monday well, evening. It's, it's a fabulous, and it shows you can do it. And there it is. It's producing all this electricity. Uh, it's not like it's an outrageous thing, but you can do it. There are a lot of things you can do if you just go about it. <clears throat> well, we're going to open it up for questions, but before we, maybe you, could, you guys can think about some of the questions. But off energy, talking about Asia, how should we deal with North Korea? I think that's in everyone's mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody says you've got to work with China, and that's perfectly obvious. China could bring North Korea to heel. But China worries. Suppose we get this under control, then what? Is there going to be a unified Korea? Are there going to be U.S. troops there? What's going to happen? And we should be ready to engage with China on the future of Korea as we would see it, as we would work with them to help bring it about. That hasn't happened. I think that's a dialogue that hasn't, has to happen. I think it's also true that as Japan and South Korea and Taiwan get more and more worried about this thing, while they have their fingers crossed and count us to provide a nuclear umbrella, they're going to more and more think, maybe we better have a nuclear weapon ourselves. And they can produce one like that. They have all of this um, uh, material from their power plants right. that they can turn into fissile uh, material and make, they could have a nuclear weapon very quickly. That's really going to get China's attention. So I think we work with them. But somehow, I think we just have to work for a dialogue of some sort with North Korea. And have a proposition that, that has appealed to them. But, also, but you don't get anywhere in bargaining unless you have a hard uh, position to bargain from. And we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. The reality is that the North Koreans have a whole string of artillery in caves aimed at Seoul. And if you bomb the areas where they are, you wouldn't get them because they're in caves. They come out to shoot. So somehow, if you're going to have a military operation, you have to take care of that as well as the main problems. And I don't know, I, I have to assume our military has thought about that a lot, and what they can do about it, I don't have any idea. But if it's going to be military, you've got to do that. And, but any use of military is going to be really terribly damaging in human terms. I yeah. have worried about nuclear weapons for a long time. In the Reagan period, we had big ambitions for big reductions, and we actually did. The number of nuclear weapons in the world today is about a third what it was at the time we had our meeting with Reykjavik, and with Gorbachev in Reykjavik. So there have been big reductions, but it's now starting to proliferate. And people have forgotten what a nuclear weapon can do. I remember, do you ever hear of the Chernobyl incident, accident, power pump, big accident? Well, I, I was fascinated that the first meeting I had with Mikhail Gorbachev after that accident, I found he had asked the same question I had. I asked an expert, okay, we see this devastation. What would it have been like if a nuclear weapon had been there? Answer, much more devastating. So that puts in your gut a realization of the, these weapons are not usable. And if they get used, the amount of human life, the amount of devastation, won't be. if a modern nuclear weapon were dropped in the Bay Area, it would incinerate everything, gone. It's that powerful, much more powerful than Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So there's that risk, and people are playing fast and loose with nuclear weapons. They, and now the Soviets are building 
I've been told, small nuclear weapons, and we're, I read that we're going to have a program like that. Sorry. There's no such thing as a small nuclear weapon. It's a nuclear weapon, and it has all those consequences that you have to worry about. We've had a program, we, we had a wonderful physicist named Sid Rowe, who died recently, He's a fantastic guy. It was over at Hoover. And I can remember when I was Secretary of State, Jim Timby and Paul Nitze, who were two of my advisors, they kept qu quoting this guy named Sid Drell as we worked on reducing nuclear weapons. So when I came back to campus, I called him up, and we had lunch, and we clicked. And we saw each other a lot. And we held a conference on the 20th anniversary of the Reykjavik meeting between Gorbachev and, and Reagan. <coughs> And out of it came an article in the Wall Street Journal that Henry Kissinger, Bill Perry, and Sam Nunn joined on. Sam was legendary ch former chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Bill had been Secretary of Defense, and Henry had been Secretary of State. I'd been Secretary of State. Sid. And it was a global, had a global impact. So, and so we began to get things under control, but now it's spun in the other direction, and I'm very worried about it. Very worried about it. Well, I was. I, I mean, just I'm, thank goodness Jim Mattis is there. That's all I can say. <laughs> and and Secretary Tillerson, uh, also. Yeah, I, and I put my State. money on Jim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's open it up for questions. Um, if you have any questions, you just uh, maybe you can say your name and uh, what school you're from, and then uh, and this is your time. Speak up because my hearing is as good as it used to be. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Why don't we wait for the the microphone? Look at that guy. He moves fast with the microphone. <laughs> All right. Hello. Um, I'm Avery. I'm studying um, civil and environmental engineering, and I was wondering, with your ample experience um, in the energy sector. Um, do you feel hopeful now in the sort of environment that we're in for a renewable energy powered uh, future? And as grad students at this time in our lives, how do you think um, we should channel our efforts to best achieve that? I think now we're probably in the best position we've ever been on energy because we know how to produce what amounts to ample supplies of gas and oil we understand the energy picture better than we have before. We have in our mind, as Run mentioned, we see that you've got to be careful about the environment, you've got to be careful about national security, you've got to be, after all, the economy runs on energy, so we have to have these things in our mind. But we're better able to do it now than ever if we just will use the tools. So we just have to keep the R&D going. It's an essential part of this. And then we have to be sensible in the ways we use it, move more toward gas for a while. This idea, it's the cruelest thing you can do to a coal miner to encourage them to think that there's going to be jobs there in the future. There isn't. The best thing you can do with a coal miner is to help them get switched into some other occupation. That's much more realistic. Um, so I think we have the tools in our hands if we will use them effectively. But you've got to use them. They don't just happen automatically. So okay. I think it's a very important thing. After, and energy is key. It's what our economy runs on, our military runs on it, our environment is affected by it. So everything is here in energy. It's really important. But we're in a better position than we've ever been to handle this well. <clears throat> In fact, the coal museum in Kentucky started putting solar panels on their roofs because it's cheaper to produce electricity that way. I think that's a sign of optimism. <laughs> well, it's a sign also that ordinary people, they understand what's going on. And it's only some of the people who are up in the abstract world that don't quite get it. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Karthik from the School of Engineering. Um, so despite the developing nations pushing for renewable energy, countries like India and Slower, China... Slower, I can't. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
despite the fact that developing countries are pushing for renewable energy, countries like India and China are still continuing to build coal plants. So is there anything America can do to incentivize developing countries to switch faster to renewable energy? Renewable energies, or did you say nuclear? Renewable. You're renewable. Saying they're building coal-fired power plants in China and India. How can the developed countries incentivize the developing countries to not build coal plants, but to move towards renewables? Well, I think the R&D has a lot to do with it. Because 20 years ago, if you said, let's go to renewables, people would think you're crazy. Because they weren't invented. Or they were invented, but they weren't anything like they are now. Right now, solar energy is, is competitive. It's a good deal. And so is wind. And as I said earlier, if we can somehow, through our R&D, break through into large-scale storage, that's a real big-time winner. So you persuade people by having something there that's concrete and does the job in a cost-efficient way. And they can see that. Um, and I think I've talked quite a lot to people in the government of China about it. They get it. Mr. Modi gets it in India. That's right. It's hard to implement, but still, they understand it. You know, just to uh, add to that, I just got back from China, and they are blocking, they're stopping um, either the operation or the construction of around 100 odd, odd coal fired power plants in China because they feel that this is going to be stranded assets in the future. So I don't think you need to incentivize them. I think they're pretty incentivized to go in the right direction. Uh, they've got double the wind capacity than the United States. So I think they, and as you said. Well, they're building nuclear power also. That's right. And I am alarmed that we are letting go of that. Uh, I think we should be maintaining our posture. And at least there's some going on, but it's basically going down. And we should be also be trying to lead the way into small nuclear reactors. And after all, Mr. Rickover did it, Admiral Rickover did it in the Navy. They power submarines and aircraft carriers and so on. We should be able to figure out how to do that. The reason we can't just use a Navy reactor is that it has weapons grade uh, uranium. uranium. So you have to figure out how to do it. But if you had small nuclear reactors, they would be buried. They would be, their fuel would last for a long time. You wouldn't have to refuel all the time. And they're small enough so that they would, they wouldn't require a huge grid around them. They'd be localized, which would be a, an advantage. Because I think one of the things we have to worry about in energy is the vulnerability of the grid to cyber attack and so on. Everybody realizes that. So the more we can have distributed energy, the better off we're going to be. So I would hope we could keep working on that. We, a couple of my people that work for me in over at Hoover published a little book on this subject. And I'm amazed at the reaction to that book. I mean, it's practically a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And they go to Washington, they get a big uh, reception, lots of interest. So I think this is something to keep working on, not just renewables, because there's no, no effluent from the nuclear power plant. I think in Korea, we are seeing <coughs> the cost of nuclear to come down. Koreans are making uh, probably world-class nuclear plants right now. United States, the cost, as we build more, the cost is going up, uh, which is in the wrong direction. Normally, the cost comes down as you build more. Well, when I was I was president of, of an engineering construction company called Bechtel for a while. And we built nuclear power plants. And you know, they have walls like this. They have rebar like that. And the regulatory agencies come along, and you get them halfway built, and they say, oh, no, change it around. That's right. <laughs> it's wild. But I understand now you can get a license to go from first concrete to turbine roll. So you, you have an open field on the construction process. So 
The regulatory apparatus is something That's that needs to be worked on. The National Regulatory Commission, or Nuclear Nuclear Regulatory Commission, is where right. really the challenge lies. You got that right. Yeah. Now, obviously, you have to regulate. You have to, but you have to regulate carefully and having in mind your impact you have on the construction process mm -hmm. and on the uncertainty you create, which holds up financing and so on. So all these things are a factor. All right, you had your hand up. Um, so. uh, my name is Tyler, I'm from the School of Business. Um, you made mention of both the military now saying that climate change could actually pose a national security threat. Um, you also brought up the topic of being able to help the Eastern uh, European countries against uh, fighting against sort of the monopoly of Russian natural, natural gas. How would you, how would you like to see the government policy to balance both future climate change, but also fighting the more immediate national security threats that we see from places like Russia and both from, from China, either by helping get their support against North Korea or by building a coalition against them in the uh, Eastern Asian area by supplying natural gas to some of these countries like Japan and, and elsewhere. Um, given the shale revolution, we really do have that ability to supply other countries with the oil and gas, but that also goes against um, a lot of the climate change issues that we are also fighting. During the Cold War, we had tension with the Soviet Union, and they had deployed intermediate range nuclear missiles that could hit from their territory, could hit European targets, hit Japan, hit China, but not us, because they were intermediate range. And their diplomatic ploy was to say, would we risk retaliation by their intercontinental missiles by using our intercontinental missiles to counter their intermediate range? So we developed a program with NATO where we would have a bargaining with the Soviet Union and trying to reach some agreement on the use of intermediate missiles. And if we couldn't come to agreement, we would deploy our own intermediate range missiles in Europe. Now, President Reagan understood that we're not only bargaining with the Soviet Union, we're bargaining with our European friends. Because when you put a, a nuclear weapon someplace, that's a target. So you don't, you're not anxious to have that kind of a target. But anyway, this was what we worked out. And we worked hard on our negotiating process that everybody could see that we were really negotiating in good faith. In the end, it was clear we weren't going to get anywhere. And so first we deployed cruise missiles, nuclear-tipped cruise missiles in Britain. Margaret Thatcher helped with that. The same in Italy. Andriotti helped us there. So cruise missiles are cruise missiles, but that's not the same as a ballistic missile. We deployed ballistic missiles in Germany, and it was a giant event. The Soviets withdrew from negotiations. They drummed up war talk. It was a very tense atmosphere. Our NATO alliance held very well together. Everybody supported the Germans. It was Helmut Kohl's finest hour. He managed it politically in Germany, and we deployed the missiles. The Soviets thought they could hit Moscow. Being, having the Germans able to destroy Moscow was an allergic thing. So <clears throat> we had President Reagan made a sort of a high-level speech. I made a more operational speech, trying to calm things down. And over time, things softened, and by August, of 1974, I was able to go to the president and say, Mr. President, at four different capitals in Europe, a Soviet diplomat has come up to one of ours and said virtually the same thing, which you think boils down to if Gomiko, the foreign minister, is invited to Washington, when he comes to the General Assembly in September, he will accept. In other words, the Soviets blinked. I said, well, you want to think this over because President Jimmy Carter canceled these Gomika meetings when they invaded Afghanistan and they're still there. He said, I don't have to think it over. Let's get them here. 
So we got Gromyko, we came to Washington. And it was kind of fun because Nancy Reagan was my pal. And she always fixed me up with a Hollywood starlet at White House dinners. I got to dance with Ginger Rogers and stuff like that. <laughs> so I went to Nancy and I said, the deal is Gromyko's gonna come in and we're gonna have a meeting in the Oval Office. The president may want to have a little sidebar one-on-one. -on -one. But then we all walk down the colonnade to the mansion, which is your home. And there's some stand-around time, and then there'll be a working lunch. So I said, how about you being there for the stand-around time? Be a nice gesture of hospitality. She said, OK, I'll do that. And so we walk down there, and Gromyko's a smart diplomat. <coughs> he sees Nancy. She, he knows she's influential. So he makes a beeline for her. And before long, he says to her, does your husband want peace? And Nancy could bristle. She said, of course my husband wants peace. And he says, well, then every night before he goes to sleep, whisper in his ear, peace. <laughs> <coughs> He's a little taller than she was, so she put her hands on his shoulder, she pulled him down where he had to bend his knee. And she said, I'll whisper in your ear, peace. <laughs> I, said, I said, Nancy, you just won the Cold War. But, <laughs> but then, after the election, I had my meetings with Gromyko in Geneva, and we got the arms controls started again, and the whole thing was now on a different track. And I believe that the deployment of those Pershing missiles in Germany was the turning point in the Cold War. Now, I think that we have to have some Pershing moments, certainly with Russia. A Pershing moment says stop, maybe in the Ukraine. We don't give lethal weapons to the Ukrainians. They are the feet on the ground. We should, I think we should do that. But anyway, some stop. And then get ourselves around to working more constructively with Russia. There's a lot to be gained by that. And with China, I don't want to go too much on my own experience, but my own experience was very good with China. Dealt with Deng Xiaoping, Wu Chen was my counterpart, and we worked out an agenda, and we worked through it, we had uh, good working. And I said to Wu Chen once, I said, whenever I come here, you put me up in the state guest house, the meetings are all in the Great Hall, and I go back and forth on the road, and I've read China as a big country, but as far as I'm concerned, it's two buildings in a road. <laughs> so he took me on a one-week trip around China. We had more fun. But one of the things we did was went to Shenzhen. And in Shenzhen, I don't know if it's still there, but there's a big amount of acreage, maybe a couple of acres, that's a miniaturization of China. You can walk around China and you get a sense of it. And then there are some buildings up above. And it turns out these buildings are, each one has a different Chinese chef. And you think Chinese food's all the same. No, it isn't. There are different kinds of chefs. They take different things. There's diversity in China. It's a lesson I'll never forget. But anyway, I think China can be worked with. It, is, it was relatively easy. And I'll tell you a story, that um, <clears throat> two stories about uh, uh, Xi. Before he was president, but he was identified as the president, we have, we have a track, too, with China that Henry Kissinger basically leads, but I help him with it. <coughs> and she gave us a dinner when we were there, and I sat next to him at the dinner. And I knew he was going to go to Washington. So I said to him, why don't you stop in San Francisco on your way to Washington? Chinese-American mayor there, he's doing a great job, and will be well received. We have Chinatown. And he said, well, he said, I can't do it because I've already agreed to stop in Los Angeles. But he said, if I came there, what I'd really want to do is come to Stanford because there's something going on around there that I would like to find out more about. And you can't really find out about it by reading. You've got to go and talk to people and interact. I thought that was a very interesting statement on his part. That he understood something about the creativity going on around here and how you learn about it. Then another occasion, there was something called the Sunnyland Summit. This was, uh, I don't know, three or four years ago when Neil President Obama was in office. 
Now, Sunnylands is an estate in Southern California that the Annenberg family had, and they've made it into a place for big public gatherings. And she sent word, she said, I'm, I want to come a day early, and I want to bring my wife. So that's a statement. I want to come, I want to get to know you. I want to become friends. I want to be able to have candid conversations where we can trust each other. We're not going to go blurry to the press about something or other. We can really explore. So that's a very good sign. My wife, who's good at protocol, gets an SOS from the State Department where she go down to Orange County and help out. So she goes down there. There is no high federal official there to meet the incoming president of China. Nobody. The First Lady sends word she can't come at all because of the birthday of one of her children, which turned out to be the following week. So Charlotte sends an SOS to Jerry Brown, our governor, and Jerry comes. So at least somebody is there to meet. So the next day, the Chinese, Xi cools his heels, and Charlotte entertains the First Lady. I said, what is she like? Oh, she's a beautiful woman. She's stylish. She's fun. She's interested in everything. She's got an operatic quality voice. They have to keep her stage appearances down or she'd be more popular than her husband. <laughs> <laughs> but a winner. This is a winner. This is a winning couple. And you know, in the world of diplomacy, you've got to get to know people and understand them and listen to them so you can develop a trusting relationship where you can have candid conversations and get down to the essence of things. And I always say in these things, trust is the coin of the realm. And that's, you know, Xi was saying, I want to have a relationship of trust. And he got turned down. It's not only a missed opportunity, it's a sign of disrespect. So we've got to change this around. And I don't know what happened down in Miralago, but at least he was received, and his wife was received. And, um, but. It doesn't look to me like it's followed up on the way I would hope, but it, I, I don't, I'm not a person who says you can't do, get along with the Chinese. You can. I've done it. And I see all this evidence that Xi will reach out and work. And I hope he will. I told Jim Mattis, you ought to go to China, Jim. He was, he was here for three years, and I know him very well, and you know him. He's, He's a wonderful guy, he's really able, works hard, reads a lot, and, um, and if you ask him his opinion, he tells you exactly what his opinion was, right between the eyes, there's no ambiguity <laughs> about it. So he's good. So I think you have to work at these things, that you have a big range of things, and people, if, if you will work with people on a trusting relationship, and most people, they will. Yes. Hi. My name is Jaime. I'm in the material science and engineering department. And I wanted to ask you why, in your opinion, the United States has resisted developing nuclear energy in comparison to other countries in Europe and Asia. Thank you. Why we have insisted on it? Why we have resisted oh, developing. Resisted. Well, we have what, what I think is called a one, two, three agreement. And we'll help people with nuclear power plants if they agree on certain restrictions on what they do with the spent fuel. And that's important because the spent fuel can be turned into a nuclear weapon. So I think it's important for us to maintain a posture in the nuclear power area so that we can continue to surround the development of nuclear power plants with the kind of atmosphere that prevents them from leading to a nuclear weapon. So that's our only resistance. But the fact is now, we don't, we don't produce stuff to sell. The Koreans do it. The, you know, other countries do it. And we're dropping out. And I think it's a mistake. As I said earlier, I think we should be back in it. And one of them, <clears throat> and the United States has always been the innovator. We started all this. And I think there's a lot of promise in the small nuclear reactor field, and we should be pushing on it. Mm -hmm. And if we could develop that as a, <clears throat> as a technology that was useful, it would have a huge impact. Everybody would want it. Because then you would 
<clears throat> think of what you would manufacture it. Your construction cost would be minimal. It would put an entirely different economics on the whole thing. And you still have the climate advantages. And you have, as I said earlier, a little bit more insurance against what can be done against the grid. <coughs> yeah, you have your hand up up there. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, can you explain more about revenue neutral carbon tax and why is it a better option? Um, speak a little. Uh, can you explain about revenue neutral carbon tax? Revenue neutral carbon tax. And why is it a better option as compared to cap and trade or maybe something Well, I think it's better than cap and trade because it has a price out there that is constant. The cap and trade, the price goes up and down all the time. You don't quite know. So I think just putting a price out there and let people compete against that price is a better way of going about it. I, I, I helped Jerry get this uh, thing passed. I wrote a letter for him to support the cap and trade here in California. But that was the only option on the table. That the carbon tax was not on the table. So, <clears throat> and if you make it revenue neutral, you don't have any drag on the economy because of the tax. And I even got one of the tax haters convinced of it because it's really not a tax if it's revenue neutral because it doesn't take any money out of the economy. And um, so that's why I advocate it. And people get a check for the carbon dividend. You know, they get a little there's check, this is your carbon no, dividend. What's not to like? No, it's not to like All of a sudden you've got <laughs> politics on your side. <coughs> Hi. Um, okay, Zan. Uh, my name is Kabir Abiyose. I'm a incoming student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I understand why one might prefer a revenue neutral carbon tax from a political perspective, but there's a potentially persuasive argument that you know that money could be used whether to you know help people that are adversely affected by emissions they don't contribute or to continue to invest in other technologies that can help decrease our amount of emissions. So my question to you is, if by some stroke of magic you were able to control how revenue from a carbon tax was spent, what activities would you prioritize? Well, first of all, I think if an activity is justifiable for you to spend money on it, money can be appropriated for that purpose. <clears throat> We've had, for quite some time now, pretty good funding for energy R&D. And that's just because people think this is a worthwhile thing to do. So things should stand on their feet that way and not be dependent on a flow of money from the carbon tax. So I would think it just, you just appropriate it as what I supported. One of the problems, as I said earlier, with the cap and trade in California is that Jerry uses it to fund his high speed rail project, which is not very popular. So a lot of people said I'm against cap and trade because I'm against the high speed rail. But if you separate the things, you're in a better position. You argue for the carbon tax or the cap and trade on its merits without having to argue all these other things. <coughs> Question over here, then over there. Uh, thank you. My name is Charles, and I'm actually from China, from the um, university where you met with Zhu Rongjian. He was the dean in our university. And so I've got a question: um, is so from the pers uh, from the perspective of scientific. Um, research, we've got many R&D progressing and we've got many new technology that can be applied. But uh, there is also a tendency currently that a consider a considerable proportion of people in the society that don't trust science and don't trust new technology. Say there are, there are people in the United States don't believe in global warming. Uh, there are people in mainland China boycotting genetic modified food, and there are people in um, Taiwan who claims to shut down all the nuclear power plants. Um, so what should the government's role be in this problem, and what should they do? Do they go with the scientists and risk 
uh, to lose the next election, or do they go with the people and do nothing, protecting the achievement by scientists? That's a good question. Trust in science. Well, you, you identify a major general problem, and that's resistance to change. I started my ap academic career teaching at MIT. So MIT is full of engineers who think if you solve an engineering problem, that's it, it's done. <laughs> and I wanted to tell them, no, it's not done, that's a start. And I developed a little book of readings and cases, and one of the readings was about the introduction of continuous aim firing into the United States Navy. And there was a young lieutenant named Sims who discovered a different way of firing. Ships roll. And the way they were firing at the time was there was a certain point in the roll of the ship when the aiming was just right and you fired. What Sims does, he developed a way of constructing the platform from the cannon so that as the ship is rolling, it can be fired continuously. Obviously, huge improvement, right? No, it's obvious. And this was tried out and experimented with and so on, and proved it out. But the bureaucracy in the Navy was, they liked the old way, and so they resisted. In fact, they were going to court-martial him. And so he wrote to uh, President Roosevelt, who was interested in the Navy, and that got people's attention. But then World War I broke out, and they immediately adopted it because, you know, <laughs> this is serious now. <laughs> so it was an example of resistance to change, which is very deep in society. And you have to think all the time, if you have something new, how are you going to get it accepted? And that takes some doing. And you start by realizing that you have a problem. You don't just think it's all going to go away. But I think the steps you take, and we're talking about energy and climate, are number one, you have something that works and is less expensive. And that's a reality that you start with. And then there's a need. And people start thinking, yeah, there's a need. And here's a way of meeting it. And you know, so you don't get impatient with people. You try to draw them into it. And, but I think if you take, for instance, solar energy, that's been an interplay. We, gradually, our scientists and engineers have figured out how to do it better and better so that the solar panels give you more electricity for less cost. And so they're now very competitive. So people see that. But also, they have to get convinced this is a good deal. And so more and more people are selling that point. And, um, and you, get a, you get a certain kind of satisfaction. I look at the solar panels on my house, and I, I kind of like it. And uh, um, it's not that they dress it up and make it look better, but I think it's kind of, I feel as though, well, I'm doing my bit. So I think you're unright to say this is a problem. And, but at the same time, I think our experience is full of examples of how some major change has taken place. So we need to study that process and see how to bring it about. We'll take the last question over there. You have your hand up for a while. <clears throat> uh, hello, sir. I'm Ayush from the Department of Electrical Engineering. So I have this question like uh, our performance, uh, the world's performance in an energy plan depends hugely on how the developing countries will perform in that respect. But the developing countries have uh, more often complained that the US and the, developing con uh, and the developed world expects a lot from them without helping them technically and providing the sufficient cooperation. So is that criticism true? And why is it so if it's... Uh, yeah, I think what he's saying is that the developed countries, um, you know, they have a criticism that the, or the developing countries, like China, India, and others, have a criticism that the developed countries are expecting too much of them, where they have to grow their economy. And whereas the developed nations, like OECD countries, um, have most of the CO2 came from them. And so how do we, if I understand you right, how do we resolve this, or is this an accurate criticism that is being? I think it's a fair point, 
on the part of the developing countries. And it needs to be recognized. And there is, I think, in the UN agreements, provision of some funds that go from the, develop the right. developing countries to kind of recognize that point and help bring about the kinds of changes that are involved. But it obviously isn't going to solve the whole problem, but at least it recognizes the problem. But underneath it all, I think everybody has to recognize that we all have this problem. And we've got to get into the habit of saying, if there's a problem, let's work together to solve the problem. And we're not doing a very good job of that in the United States these days, but we used to do a lot better. I can remember people are talking about tax reform now. I could say. In 1986, we brought about a huge tax reform um, piece of legislation. It passed the Senate 97 to 3. So those were the days when we could say, all right, the point is to solve the problem, not to make political points. And actually, the legislation was introduced in both in the House by Dick Gephardt, who was the Democratic leader, and in the Senate by Bill Bradley, who was a Democrat. And as somebody asked President Reagan if it bothered him, two Democrats introduced this legislation. He had proposed it. He said it passed, didn't it? That's the point. So I think that we have to get ourselves in a problem-solving frame of mind and recognize the point you are making. And I think, to yep. a certain extent, some money helps to do that. But at the same time, the real point is to develop ways of dealing with the problem that work and are inexpensive. And we're gradually doing that. And so if there's one message I could leave today is that Energy R&D, we now see over a period of time, has worked. That has produced new, different things that give us clean energy at less cost, more secure energy. So it has worked. So let's keep doing what has worked. And we'll be better off, and everybody will be better off, and share the results broadly. There's an interesting program the State Department has that um, I was not aware of until you came over. And that is, they get a guy like Arun, and they say, go to country X and find counterparts, and let's develop a kind of scientific back and forth, and maybe some of them can come here, and we can go there and share ideas. And you, you did that. In fact, it was very interesting. I was, uh, they asked me, where, where do you want to go? I said, I'll go wherever you want me to go. So they sent me to the Baltics and Poland, given in talking about Baltics. Uh, um, and, and I was hosted out there by the ambassadors, the US ambassadors out there. And all of them said that, I'm so glad you're here. Because all we get now are, you know, it's not that we don't like, but we only get military people, US. Uh, military people. You're the only non-military person who's actually come here and spent some time because they, w they want to build relationships which are not just military but more civilian on the scientific side. So they were extremely happy. Yeah, but what you were doing was a big contribution to their security. The security, right. Yeah. In many ways more than the military. So on that <coughs> high note, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for coming and spending an hour with, uh, with all these incoming graduate students um, out here who are interested in energy. Um, uh, I think this is, as you just heard, um, while you are focusing on your master's and PhD in material science or some, or economics or GSB, there's a broader view out here that you can get in Stanford. And I think while you're here as students, make the most of this time and get this broader view while you're here. So thank you. Let's thank Mr. Secretary. Thank you.